I'm Henry Brady, former Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy and a political scientist who studies American institutions, especially such things as trust in American institutions. I'll be moderating today's session. We have an all-star cast here today, and I'll introduce them in a moment. First, let me set the stage. We live in an era where a majority of Republicans believe that Donald Trump won the presidential election, whereas Democrats believe overwhelmingly that Biden won, where a substantial fraction of people believe that COVID is fake or that the vaccines for COVID have not been thoroughly tested and that they have bad side effects. Where watchers of Fox News believe that Christians in America face more discrimination than black Americans and other people of color. These beliefs exist against the background of partisan polarization between the two political parties and lack of trust for major American institutions. Republicans trust the police, the military, and religion, whereas Democrats trust education, science, and the press. Partisan polarization and disinformation, the decline of journalism, especially local journalism, and the rise of the internet with its ability to spread rumors and lies as truths seem to be at the root of these problems. What can we do about them? We're gonna spend some time first asking what's the problem and then trying to see if we can come up with some solutions. The panel is a distinguished one. Gita Anand is Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author and, author and Dean of the Graduate School of D Journalism. Erwin Chemerisky is Dean of Berkeley Law and one of the nation's leading authorities on the First Amendment and the Constitution. Connie Farid, Associate Dean and Head of the School of Information, is an expert on digital forensics, deep fakes, cybersecurity, and human perception. Susan Hyde is Chair of the Department of Political Science, Co-Director of the Institute of International Studies, and a scholar who studies democratic backsliding, countries that are becoming more authoritarian by the day. And John Powell is director of the Othering and Belonging Institute and an expert in civil rights, civil liberties, structural racism, and democracy. I'm gonna mod uh, moderate the panel, as I said, let's get going. Um, so what are the sources and nature of the problem? Let me start with Hannah Fareed, who knows a lot about the internet. What is disinformation? What has changed socially and technologically to ignite the current storm of disinformation? What are the dangers from social media especially. Uh, thank you, Henry, and good to be here with such uh, an amazing group of uh, my colleagues here on the Berkeley campus. Uh, let's, let's start with some definitions. Um, let's start by distinguishing between disinformation and misinformation, which are often used interchangeably. Disinformation is the intentional spreading of lies and conspiracies. Think, for example, uh, state-sponsored actors trying to sow civil unrest or interfere with an election. Think partisan hacks and trolls on Twitter and Facebook. Misinformation, on the other hand, is the unintentional spreading of lies. Think your quirky Uncle Frank um, Facebook posts about how Bill Gates is using COVID to implement a mandatory vaccine program with tracking microchips. By the way, a pretty bizarre claim that some 28% of Americans uh, believe. So disinformation, of course, is not new, and we should acknowledge that. For as long as there's been information, there's been disinformation. However, in the digital age, I don't think it'll surprise you to learn that, in particularly in the age of social media, the nature and threat of dis disinformation is quite distinct. So first, we've democratized access to publishing. Many great things have come from that, but that now anybody with nothing more than a handheld device can instantaneously reach millions of people around the world. Second, the gatekeepers of social media are not traditional publishers. And so posts that drive engagement are favored over just about everything else with little consideration to journalistic standards um, or harm. Now here it's important to understand that critical to social media success is driving engagement and time spent on the platform and in turn ad revenue. So this is accomplished um, not by chance, but by algorithmically determining what shows up on your social media feed. These algorithms aren't optimized for an informed citizenship, civility, or truth. 
Instead, repeated studies from outside of the social media companies and inside of the social media companies have shown that social media's algorithms favors outrage, favors anger, lies, and conspiracies because that drives engagement. And it's this algorithmic amplification that is the most significant difference today in the disinformation landscape. So let me just say a few more things on because you asked a series of these questions and I wanna try to hit each of them. An additional threat to this algorithmic amplification or manipulation is the risk of filter bubbles in which, as you said at the very beginning, Henry, we seem to have two alternate realities because we are all consuming content inside of an echo chamber and a filter bubble driven by social media. And so although disinformation is not new, what we are seeing is a scale in belief and even the most bizarre conspiracies that is unprecedented in history. So here's another example, for example. The far-reaching, far-right QAnon conspiracy claims, among many things, that a cabal of Satan-worshipping, cannibalistic pedophiles and child sex traffickers plotted against Donald Trump during his term as president. It's a pretty outrageous, even by American conspiracies, however, a recent poll finds that 37% of Americans are unsure whether this conspiracy is true or false, and a full 17% believe it to be true. In addition, we're seeing widespread vaccine hesitancy promoted all over social media with huge, huge implications to our public health. We're seeing, as you said at the beginning, widespread U.S. election lies with huge implications for our democracy. And we're seeing widespread climate change dis and misinformation with huge implications for our entire planet. So this disinformation is leading, and I don't think this is hyperbolic, to existential threats to our society and democracy. And I don't know how we have a stable society and a democracy if we can't agree on basic facts because everybody is being manipulated by attention-grabbing, dopamine-fueled algorithms that promote the dredges of the internet, creating these bizarre, fact-free, alternate reality. I'd very much like to believe in Brandeis's concept that the best remedy for these falsehoods is more truce, not silence. But this only works in a fair marketplace of ideas where ideas compete fairly on their merits, but social media doesn't come even close to being a fair marketplace of ideas. It is manipulating users in order to maximize profits. And there it is, Henry, is the big difference today from 20 years ago is how we are being actively manipulated in terms of the information we are being presented. Thank you. So John Powell, uh, we've just heard the technological reasons why things have changed and outlined really adroitly. What about human beings and our psyches, and maybe especially Americans, how much of this is based upon our tendencies towards tribalism and othering? Uh, what can we do to minimize that and to limit the degree to which those kinds of factors affect the way people process information? Is that part of the problem? Well, th thank you, Henry. Uh, it's, first of all, it's a delight to be here with such distinguished guests, and I look forward to hearing and learning from all of you. Um, the problem, you know, we sort of have a better sense of the problems than we do of solutions. Uh, the problems are multifaceted. I suggest that the, the internet, social media has sort of complicated the problem by far. Um, but I'm, I'm reading uh, Martha Nesboom's book now on religion and, and fear. And uh, Aristotle was talking about this problem 2000 years ago um, and that it could be hijacked. Um, and so part of it does sort of mesh with human nature and society. Um, tribalism is interesting. Um, I'm part of More in Common and I, I looked at some of their materials in preparation for today's call, uh, today's talk. Um, I'm not in favor of the term tribalism and I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, think about the US history and our relationship with tribes here. Uh, in a sense, you could say uh, by, uh, by many accounts, the tribes were much more welcoming to the Europeans than the Europeans were welcoming to the tribe. But even more uh, pointedly, tribalism as we understand it, evolutionary, tribes were only, were small. They ranged from anywhere from uh, 50 to about 150 people. Uh, there were people you had contact with every day. There were people that you knew. Uh, and yes, yeah, so in that you had all kinds of what we would call biases. These were the people you trusted. Uh, but tribes couldn't be a thousand people. 
tribes couldn't be a million people. Um, and so what we're seeing, I think uh, tribes is actually a misnomer. Uh, and so what allows for people who don't know each other, who will never see each other, to actually feel like they're part of the same group and, and, and hostile to another group, whether it's blacks or Jews or Muslims. Uh, so I think tribalism, it, like I said, is a misnomer. But I do think changing demographics uh, actually plays a big part. Uh, and there's, uh, as discussed, there's polarization and identity uh, along ideological lines, but there's also along social lines, along people. Uh, and there's very strong correlation between anxiety of change of demographics and uh, polarization. It doesn't have to happen. I think it sort of seeds, it creates an environment and then people use it. Uh, the elites use it to actually uh, constitute or exaggerate the fear and the threat. Um, and, and one thing that's very important, I think, to, to sort of point out is that the other is not natural. Uh, the other is socially constructed. Uh, the meaning and content of the other is socially constructed. Uh, and it's not saying we're all the same, but the meaning, uh, especially saying that someone's not fully human, uh, that they're a threat, that they're like an animal, uh, that they smell, they're smelly. There, there's certain words that show up over and over and over and over again, whether you're talking about, again, blacks or Jews or immigrants or East, um, and it's the dominant group if you will, leaders oftentimes, uh, using that to sort of create a sense of us and them. So this is calculated. Uh, as suggested, this is not uh, misinformation, this is disinformation. The tools available are more profound than they used to be 20 years ago. Um, but also the changing demographics, and I'll end by just saying this, think about the report of the census data. I was very unhappy with the reporting. The reporting from my perspective was laced with fear. And it may have been implicit, but it's like almost like saying, white people be afraid. You know, you're about to lose. Uh, the minorities, people, black people, Latinos, they're, they're coming and you're going to lose. Uh, and it had just scores of stories about this white anxiety. And it didn't paint a picture of how we might be a society where all the racial majority and, how, and living in harmony and peace and, and coming together. It said nothing about the explosive expression of American families now one of the fastest growth are mixed race, mis ethnic families. Uh, that's potentially a positive. It simply was absent from the story. Thanks, John. So that's the human side. And then there's journalism. Historically, the way we've learned about others is through journalism. Uh, Gita and Ann, have things changed for journalism? And is part of the problem, the decline of journalism? Or did journalism never have a chance with respect to the internet? And, and also, are there other historical periods that look like the one we're in now? And is there hope that we can get out of the mess we're in? Um, thanks, Henry. And it's a pleasure to be uh, amongst this group discussing this incredibly enormous challenge um, to democracy and to our world. Um, I mean, the rise in social media has shifted ad revenue and shifted public attention away from traditional news publications. There's been a 62% drop in ad revenue for traditional news publications in uh, between 2008 and 2018. Um, more than 2,000 of the 9,000 publications around in 1995 are no longer around today. More than half of people under 30 get most of their political news from social media. News publications just cannot compete with social media and with disinformation. Disinformation is cheap. It's expensive to train people to go out and report news, um, to check sources, to make phone calls, to check public records. Social media companies are making billions and news organizations are barely hanging on and they're weakened just at the time where we need them most. Um, I think Hani talked about this, um, but also John Powell, uh, negative information um, 
controversial information draws attention and always has. I, Tristan Harris uh, famously said that fake news spreads six times uh, as fast as um, credible news. Um, again, putting traditional news organizations at a disadvantage. And there's confusion in the public minds about what actually is a, a legitimate news publication and what actually are facts and what are not. And there's huge distrust in the media right now. Um, and I believe this is because of the decline in local news publications, those thousands of local news publications that have gone out of business. So this means that most people have never met a reporter. They don't understand how reporters do their jobs. They don't understand journalism ethics. When they do meet a journalist, it's when um, some huge catastrophe has happened in their community and someone has come in from far away to do a story on their community, someone who doesn't know that community very well. Um, so people think of journalists as elite outsiders, uninformed about their world and their lives. Um, this is a problem. <laughs> and the situation is getting worse. More and more traditional news publications are failing and social media is getting more of the revenue and more of the eyeballs. Um, there's just a cacophony of sources um, on the internet, many of them random organizations, many with poor, with, with evil intent, um, without editors demanding accuracy, um, without editors deciding what stories should be most, what are the most important for the day. And as all of you know, and as all of you have said, democracy um, needs an engaged and informed public to be having debate and dialogue. And if we can't even agree on a set of facts, if we're so polarized and so confused about <clears throat> what the facts are um, and about our information, we are at a huge disadvantage in being able to deal with the enormous crises of our times from climate change and on and on. Um, so we absolutely need to, as a society, um, address this enormous challenge and um, you know, the success and survival of journalism is vital to the su success and survival of democracy. Thanks. Thanks, Gita. Erwin um, Chemerinsky, uh, the legal framework here is complicated and could you clarify two things, I think. Exactly what does the First Amendment do to perhaps create some of these problems because of the so-called marketplace of ideas and the uh, failure to limit some kinds of speech? And second of all, the Communications Decency Act of 1996 and especially the Section 230, which gave the internet a very privileged kind of sort of role. Of course. It really is a pleasure to be part of this discussion. Let me put this in context. I think the internet is the most powerful tool for expression since the development of the printing press. As already mentioned, it democratizes the ability to reach a mass audience. It used to be you had to be rich enough to own a newspaper or get a broadcast license to reach a large number of people. Now anyone with a smartphone or access to a modem in a library can do so. It gives all of us access to seemingly infinite information, and it doesn't respect national boundaries. It's very hard for any country to exclude speech over the internet from other nations. But this comes at a cost. Speech is very cheap over the internet. That cheap speech can be used for misinformation or disinformation. Speech that's harmful, that invades privacy, can be immediately circulated, and it also lets other countries influence electoral processes. We saw what Russia did in 2016 in the United States. In terms of Section 230, your latter question, Section 230, I believe, was the key to the development of the internet. It says that internet companies can't be held liable for that which is posted there. In fact, it's been said that Section 230, which is 23 words, are the 23 words that created the internet. Without Section 230, the internet companies would have to monitor everything that is put there because if they didn't, 
and there was something that was illegal or tortious, they could be prosecuted, held civilly liable. It allows people to post things on the internet and social media without the risk of significant censorship from the internet companies. Now, that's not to say the internet companies aren't monitoring. They're clearly doing things like excluding child pornography. They're excluding hate speech. They're doing this on their own, not for fear of liability. Section 230 protects them. And it's in that context, I can talk about the First Amendment, Henry, and answer your question. The First Amendment, of course, limits the ability of government at all levels to protect speech. First Amendment isn't absolute. There are categories of speech that are unprotected or less protected. Child pornography is an example. Speech that incites illegal activity. Speech that constitutes a true threat. And we go on with the other categories of unprotected speech. How does this all relate to the internet? Well, in a couple of ways. First, the internet companies, the major social media companies, things like Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and Google are private entities. They do not have to comply with the First Amendment. They can decide to include what they want or exclude what they want. When some of the social media companies excluded Donald Trump, he sued and said this violates the First Amendment. As a matter of constitutional law, that's nonsense because these social media companies are private. They're not the government. They don't have to comply with the First Amendment. Key principle, the First Amendment limits what government can do, not private entities. But there's a second way in which this is relevant too. The First Amendment protects private entities from being regulated by the government. The government can't regulate newspapers and what they publish. That would run afoul of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Well, the First Amendment also limits the ability of the government to regulate social media companies, even if it wants to. And finally, what I would say is the assumption of the First Amendment is that generally more speech is better. And if false things are said, the best response is true things. What we've talked about so far today is all of the problems with that, but I'm not sure what's better than it. The alternative to allowing the marketplace of ideas to work is to give the government the power to decide what's true and false and censor what's false. And I am much more afraid of that than I am of allowing all the ideas to be expressed, even in light of the problems we've discussed. Thanks, Erwin. Uh, a great uh, synopsis of the issues. Uh, Susan Hyde, let's get a little bit beyond America and talk about what's happening around the world uh, with various countries. Are these same kinds of factors operating in other countries and how are they affecting those countries with respect to the uh, health of their democracy and the future of their democracies? Thanks, Henry. Uh, it's a real honor to be here and so important to continue talking about this. Um, both today and, and continuing in the future. Uh, as Gita said, it really influences our ability as a society and as humans around the world to address a long list of other challenges that require collective action. I think disinformation is really pernicious um, in our ability to address a whole host of problems. Uh, of course, this is nothing new in some sense. Propaganda has been around for a long time and has been used very frequently to try to sway elections and voting behavior in other countries, both from within, um, often by the government in power, um, but also from without. So folks have already mentioned uh, Russian interference in the US elections, uh, but historically it's important to acknowledge um, that the former USSR, now Russia, and the United States have been active in promoting propaganda and election interference in a lot of countries around the world. So this is not new in some sense, um, but what is new is that this toolkit uh, that is related to disinformation and the use of social media for disinformation specifically is I think the scale and the ability to target messages at the individual level in a manner that can be, but of course isn't always harder to document um, and they're therefore harder to understand the extent of, uh, which is important for some of us who are interested in thinking about the degree to which 
these are problems for elections. All elections have some problems. Um, it's not about one voter not having a chance to vote in our typical evaluations. It's usually about um, the extent of the problem. And if we're not sure how many people were affected by disinformation or exactly what forms of disinformation they received, um, it can be very difficult to have a, a solid assessment in real time about um, how, how an election proceeded. Um, and this is a problem in a lot of countries around the world. We're pretty used to thinking about election fraud um, as a, a game of, of cat and mouse um, or a game of uh, evolving strategy. So lots of efforts to deter election manipulation have been met with counter efforts. Um, and, and this is one area in which I think um, the micro-targeting uh, of disinformation actually makes it even more difficult to come up with those countermeasures. One of the things that I wanted to reference is that uh, we're talking about this as a phenomenon that's taking place in many countries around the world. There's an ongoing uh, study out by a group of scholars out of Oxford. Uh, the 2020 study documented the use uh, by governments and political parties of social media uh, to manipulate governance processes or elections in 81 countries. Um, I don't have time to delve into how the tools and strategies vary, uh, but I think it's important to acknowledge that not everything that we've seen in the United States is what other countries are seeing around the world. And why is that? That's um, important for us to acknowledge in part because we might see some of these other things here soon, um, but also uh, in thinking about solutions, I think it's important to acknowledge that what we're, what we're seeing here is just a small slice. There are also increasingly documented cases in which businesses are using these tools on behalf of political actors. A lot of this is for hire. Um, and I think this is connected to the more general sense that we're in a period of democratic backsliding in many countries around the world. Um, and it's clear from the experiences in other countries that there are really dozens, if not hundreds of ways to combine these new tools of disinformation with the old menu of or the classic tools of election manipulation. So I think it can make things like vote buying easier, for example. It can make voter intimidation easier, for example. Um, and because it makes it easier to target specific individuals, it's potentially more pernicious and more difficult to document. Uh, one other thing I'll note that's not disinformation, but we are seeing authoritarian governments um, diffuse their surveillance technology to one another. So they're sharing technologies for the surveillance of their own citizens. This is not exactly disinformation, but I do think it's connected to this broader conversation about how disinformation is influencing voting and democracy around the world. I'll stop there. Thank Thanks, you. Susan. Uh, okay, I think we've established that there is a problem, there are a set of issues, and it's a complicated situation. Uh, let me now go on to ask if we've got solutions. Um, let's start with the ones that we always hope that we have, which are technological fixes. Honey, are there technological fixes for what's going on? Uh, yeah, can you, the internet police itself with technology? Yeah, you, since technology sort of got us into this mess, you'd hope that there are some technological so solutions to get us, help us get out of this mess. So there's a number of challenges here. Let me enumerate them first. First, social media operates on an unimaginably large and global scale. Every day, four petabytes, that's more than 4 million gigabytes of data are uploaded to Facebook every day. And every minute, there's more than 500 hours of video uploaded to YouTube. Mitigating harm at that scale can be an enormous challenge just because of the volume and the borderless nature of this content. Second, um, we should acknowledge uh, that while some disinformation is easy to identify, the earth is not flat. Um, the video purporting to show Nancy Pelosi drunk is fake. Hillary Clinton is not, in fact, running a child porn ring out of a basement of a pizza joint in D.C. On the other hand, other pieces of information might be harder to classify. For example, theories of the origin of COVID have been um, in flux over the last year. And so deciding what is true and what is not can also be tricky. Third, and this was already mentioned, but it's worth mentioning again, we have seen some less than democratic countries and at least one US president stifling criticism by crying fake news um, because of inconvenient facts. And so we have to tread very lightly here on labeling things as true or false. So that's sort of the bad news in some ways. But on the other hand, 
recent studies have shown that despite the scale of Facebook, on Facebook, 65% of COVID-related disinformation originated from only 12 people, the so-called dirty dozen, as they're called. Similarly, in our own studies, we found that by reducing the visibility of about a dozen channels, YouTube was able to significantly decrease the prevalence of conspiracies in their recommendations. So in some cases, the problem is not actually that big and could be as simple as demoting a relatively small number of very, very bad actors responsible for a large amount of disinformation. Now, we've also seen that tweaking the underlying recommendation algorithms that I was talking about earlier can have a big impact on mitigating disinformation. So in 2020, Facebook conducted an interesting experiment called Good for the World, Bad for the World, in which their users were asked to categorize posts as one or the other. And what re Facebook researchers found is that there was a positive correlation between the popularity of a post and its categorization as bad for the world. This is what Gita was talking about earlier. Then Facebook trained the recommendation algorithms to make bad for the world posts less visible. They didn't ban them. They didn't delete them. They just made them less visible on our news feeds. And the research was successful. It reduced content that was, quote unquote, bad for the world. Um, but you know what else it did? It reduced the amount of time that people spend on Facebook. And so what Facebook said was, nice try, but we're literally going to turn this off and now knowingly recommend posts that we know are bad for the world. So there are mitigation strategies, despite the challenges, the scale, the definitional problems, there are mitigation strategies that are fairly well understood and could be implemented. The problem, of course, is that these changes are not necessarily good for corporate profits, and here we run into the tension here. So I would argue that while the problem of disinformation is complex, the problem with disinformation on social media today is not primarily one of technology, but one of corporate responsibility. I would also argue that we can mitigate harm without, and this is to Erwin's point earlier, without necessarily banning specific types of speech or users, but instead we can tweak, as we have already seen, the underlying recommendation algorithms to simply favor civility and trust over hatred, lies, and conspiracies. And of course, there are some definitional things that we have to get right there. The last thing I'll say here is we have been waiting for now several decades for the technology sector to find their moral compass. And they have not seemed to be able to do that. They continue to unleash technology that is harmful to individuals, to groups, to societies, and to democracies. And left to their own devices, that will continue. We cannot sit back and say, well, the technology sector will self-regulate. We need to start thinking about modest, and thoughtful regulation that will put some pressure points um, on the technology sector. Erwin was talking about Section 230 of CDA, which has removed many of the pressure points. You don't want to add too much because then the government risks overreaching, but too little, we have the mess that we have right now. And so the question is, how do you balance those issues? But again, I want to just emphasize, while there are technological challenges, I think many of the issues, we actually know how to address a significant amount of them. We're just choosing not to. Thanks, Hank. Uh, so Gita, the journalism uh, is in decline. It has problems, especially at the local level, but also otherwise. Uh, is there an argument to be made that the social media companies should be asked to take some of their profits and give them to journalism? Uh, and maybe that can be done through a tax on internet uh, exchanges uh, or, or ads or something like that, and that that would be given to journalists so that local journalism could perhaps thrive more? Um, that there's definitely an argument to be made in that regard, Henry. And um, I think um, <clears throat> journalism and democracy would benefit from such a tax. Um, other ideas, though, for rebuilding um, trust. We, because a key um, a key problem is the lack of visibility of good journalism, but also the lack of trust in the media. Um, and something I'm really in favor of, and um, that the journalism school here at Berkeley is um, is investing in, is local news. We really need to, unless we build back up local news 
uh, publications. Um, people are not going to see reporters doing that work. They're not going to know them. They're not going to understand what journalism is, is about. And they're not going to believe um, in journalism. Um, we have two new publications, um, Richmond Confidential and Oakland North, and we've been investing more in them in the last couple of years, hiring an editor. But other uh, there's other nonprofit efforts to do the same. Report for America is an incredible effort to put local journalists and publications around this country. ProPublica, which is the best nonprofit investigative organization in the country, is a uh, collaborating much more with local reporters to produce local investigations, holding local governments accountable. I think universities around the country could commit themselves to investing, could and should commit themselves to investing in the local publications around them as one small step to, um, to improving um, the sustainability of local news and to promoting trust in journalism. Um, but, but to your point, Henry, when you asked about this tax, I mean, the, re, the, the, the economics of journalism are broken. Advertising revenues have, um, in most, more than 50% of advertising revenues have shifted to social media from traditional news organizations. Um, many of the best news organizations have shifted to the subscription model and have seen subscriptions rise astronomically. Um, especially in the last few years, as many people have recognized the value and importance of investigative reporting on everything from our president to climate change um, to Facebook, an incredible series in the Wall Street Journal, the Facebook files this past week. Um, the problem is that people aren't willing to pay um, for news when there's so much disinformation available masquerading as news. For example, I was talking to a friend of mine, a colleague actually here at, um, at Berkeley Journalism who was in, who's Mexican and was in Mexico recently. Um, all the anti-vax propaganda was being spread. She was, her friends were believing it. And there was a New York Times story countering exactly um, the, the misinformation or disinformation in one story, she, she shared it with all of her friends, but none of them had New York Times subscriptions. So they weren't actually able to open the story that countered the disinformation. Um, so clearly we need uh, solutions to fix the journalism ecosystem. And the tax idea, I think, is a brilliant one. Um, but I think that the solution to the disinformation problem will need to be multifaceted. We'll need to convene experts um, in all different disciplines as are here on this call. Um, I think Berkeley can do that. It, um, we're situated, we have the most incredible brains, legal brains, you know, technology experts, public policy, government, you know, um, belonging experts, journalism experts here right on our campus. And I'm hoping, and I've been taking, I, together with you, been taking some steps to be conveners of finding a solution to this problem um, in which we cannot have any, um, any area that we refuse to consider or reconsider. Um, we have to think outside the box. Um, and we have to include the industry um, in helping us understand where the solutions lie um, in a way that doesn't make them feel defensive, um, which they are, um, but somehow we have to bring people together and, um, and address this in a legislative way um, immediately. Great. Thank you, Gita. Uh, it's easy to believe fantastic things about other people when you're othering them, when they're not sort of like your next door neighbor or your family. Uh, John Powell is an expert in thinking about othering. How can we as a nation go beyond trying to just fix the internet or fix journalism to actually fix the problem we have, maybe that's at the root of a lot of this, which is that we other one another and we have done so throughout much of our history? Well, it's an important question. It's a great question. Um, the, um, and you're right, Henry, it's, it's, this, is, this is a 
problem that's hypercharged by technology, but it's not simply a technological problem. Mm. Um, for example, if you look at voting trends, part of this voting trend shows is that uh, racial and ethnic segregation actually increase extreme voting. Uh, when people actually only hang out with people like themselves and homogeneous groups, the groups are more likely to be extreme. And America has never dealt with, in fact, I would say we've actually, uh, we came up with a recent study showing that the country is actually moving toward greater segregation, uh, both racial, economic, but also ideological segregation. So if you're conservative, you're more likely to live with people who are just conservative. If you're liberal, you're more likely to live with people who are just liberal. Um, and to your point, Henry, once you other people, you actually, we have a, a lot of data showing people actually don't understand the other side. They exaggerate their views. Um, some of the polarization is more uh, perception than reality. Uh, we actually are closer together. Also, the, the people who drive politics are relatively small. Uh, there's a large section of people who just turned off. Uh, and they don't want to be in, in the sling fight. They actually want something different, but they don't know how to get it there. Um, uh, so I think uh, uh, these are huge problems. Um, and, and the idea that fear moves faster than a positive emotion. So if you're, if you're trying to increase fear, you have a huge advantage. If you're trying to cre increase hate, you have a huge advantage already on your side. It's much more difficult to create these other mechanisms. And I agree with the speak other speakers. It has to be deliberate. Um, and I don't think it will fix itself. I don't think the uh, technology, uh, and I, I believe the container is actually has a crack in it and it might break altogether. It's not clear to me that democracies will survive this unless we do something very deliberate and very robust. And I agree we have to put a lot of things on the table uh, and, and I mean, we've just watched years and even the study that was cited earlier in terms of Facebook saying, yeah, we could, we could fix the problem, but at what cost to us? And we, the question is, if you don't fix the problem, what's the cost to democracy? <laughs> That's not the question they're asking. They're asking what's the problem to the cost of their shareholders? Um, so I think, I think this should be a major effort if not by Berkeley, by multiple universities and others. I mean, we, we really are in a, someone called an existentialist ontological product, uh, challenge. Um, and I mean, I started writing about authoritarianism in like 2004 and I, I didn't anticipate how broad it would become uh, in 16, 17 years. Uh, it was like this cottage industry, a few of us writing about it, thinking about it. Uh, it's, now it's, as I say, democracy in retreat and it's on his heels. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that it's not just factual. We talk about people getting factual information. People actually join groups to belong. Uh, people actually, uh, there's a lot of work that, uh, uh, that's done through social media and things. People are not just going to social media to get the facts. They're going to feel like they belong. They're going to for community. Uh, and once you're in that community, in a sense, that community polices you. Uh, and so part of the thing is that the sense of belonging in America is in steep decline. Uh, most Americans feel very isolated. They don't feel connected to the community, to the nation, to institutions. And then they become prey to these really extreme groups where you can at least belong. Uh, and so again, it's not just a cognitive thing. How do we have people be smarter to process facts? Is that uh, what's being done, one last thing I'll mention, there was someone being interviewed about Donald Trump and the interviewer was, was citing out, well, this is a lie. He just lied on this. And the person basically said, of course he lies. <laughs> you know, I know that, I'm not stupid. Um, but he creates a community. He cares about us. That's what's important. Uh, so I think we have to be much more sophisticated than assuming that this is just a question of truth versus fiction. Thanks, John. I'm going to follow up with John. He has to leave at one o'clock, and I want to get a, a bit more of his wisdom. Um, uh, a recent report from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences called Our Common Purpose made a bunch of recommendations for how we could maybe minimize or even eliminate othering. And they suggested things like universal public service, where everybody would have a year of public service 
Uh, this would not necessarily be the military, this could be AmeriCorps, this could be all sorts of uh, community activities. And the idea would be to mix and mingle people so they would get to know one another. Another thing they recommended is a Telling Our Nation's Story initiative that would fund efforts around the country to bring people together from all diverse perspectives to tell their stories as part of the nation's stories. Are those the kinds of things we should be supporting and thinking about uh, to reduce the amount of othering that occurs in our society? Or are there other ways that we could do it? That's certainly part of it. I mean, people, especially on Berkeley, you know, people uh, hate for me to give this example, but one of the most successful examples of addressing othering is the military. Uh, and part of it is that you bring people from diverse backgrounds together. Uh, think about it. You oftentimes, not to exaggerate, but you're young black man, young Latino man, young white man off from the South, put them, in a, put, put them together and give them a gun. That sounds like a tragedy. <laughs> that sounds like an accident about to happen. But instead, what happens in the military's worked on it is you have to get lifelong friendships. Um, and part of it is, is what you're saying, Henry, people doing something together with a common mission and getting to know each other and re relying on each other. We know a lot about contact theory, uh, telling better stories. Um, so yes, I think something like that, um, because a democracy depends on the idea of being able to take another's perspective, uh, being able to see another person. And othering is a caricature. When we other people, we flatten them. They become, they become a single or dimension, just this. They're just black, they're just gay, they're just this. All of us have multiple dimensions. And, and I'm rushing through things. Um, it's not impossible to hate up close, but it is harder. It is harder, especially if we do it right. Um, and so yes, telling each other stories, uh, telling different stories, telling stories about a larger we and about a new future, but also having um, some common purpose. I mean, even things like football games, you know, I mean, where people come together, um, there's a whole bunch of literature showing how important Jackie Robinson was in terms of breaking the, the, uh, the color line, not just in baseball, uh, but in society. Uh, when you had whites who otherwise didn't know any blacks and didn't like blacks cheering him on, that made a difference. So we're not using a lot of the information we know and we need new information as well. I grew up with Jackie Robinson as a hero and the Brooklyn Dodgers as heroes and vividly remember the 1955 World Series where the Dodgers finally won the World Series. Uh, so, Erwin, uh, the legal framework here is complicated. Let me, let me use a vivid analogy. And I know it's a bit unfair, but I'm gonna use it anyway. If we had a water company uh, that didn't check the quality of the water and people were pouring poison into the water system and, 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 and that was affecting people's health, would we be happy with that? Would we allow the legal framework to continue to do that? No, but the analogy isn't an apt one. To start with, the water company isn't protected by the First Amendment. Also, there is no harm in forcing the water company to monitor the quality of the water. There's only good to come. But I think there's great harm if we would create liability of media companies when it comes to the false and damaging information there. A newspaper exercises editorial judgment over what's within the newspaper. The water company exercises control over what's in the water. But the whole idea of Section 230 is that the internet and social media companies should be platforms where any speech can be expressed. That's why there's no analogy to your water, analogy, water example or to newspapers. It was mentioned earlier, there are 4.75 billion pieces of information posted on Facebook each day. If Facebook could be held liable for anything there that might be criminal, might commit a tort, Facebook would have to monitor all of that. And undoubtedly, Facebook would err on the side of taking things down rather than facing liability. We wouldn't lose just the harmful water we would lose so much of the good water as well. For a while, I came to believe that it would be possible to say, well, we'll only create liability for media companies and social media companies if they have knowledge that there's this harmful material and if they don't take it down. But then I looked at an analogous law, it's called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and it creates an obligation to take down things 
when there's an allegation of copyright infringement. And I learned that the takedown provisions led to tremendous over-censorship and loss of information that we'd want to have when we want to have speech. Henry, everyone wants to criticize Section 230. The right criticizes it. President Trump threatened to veto a defense appropriation bill unless Congress changed Section 230. The left criticizes Section 230. But having studied this carefully, I don't see a better alternative. And I worry that if we were to repeal or change Section 230, the result would be much worse. In fact, you were talking about the American Academy, and they said that with regard to debate about political speech online, quote, it requires solutions outside the scope of reforming or repealing Section 230. I think what we should be doing is putting social pressure on the media companies themselves to do a better job of excluding unconstitutional, harmful, illegal, tortious, hateful speech. They can do that because they're not the government. They can regulate speech as they choose. We should put pressure on them to change their algorithms. But I think it's much better that it come from the media comp- social media companies and pressure on them than it come through government regulation. Um, I'm convinced that any effort to try to significantly modify Section 230 will be much harmful, that it will be beneficial. So uh, we're going to get to Susan Hyde in a minute, and but in the but I want somebody to maybe reply to Erwin and talk about his position because he's got a very absolutist First Amendment position. Let's start with Gita, and maybe Hani wants to say something, and then we'll go to Susan. I think of just the burgeoning social media as just a whole new infrastructure in this world. Um, And I just think if we had sort of a whole new rail system or a whole new air traffic system, a whole new system of transportation like air, we we have over the centuries regulated whole new systems of infrastructure that have been invented. Um, And I'm just not convinced that we can count on social media just based on the track record to regulate itself, um, I hugely support pressuring social media companies to see themselves more as news organizations with a social, with a responsibility for accurate information. But I think that there's, I, su- I support a suggestion, or I'm interested in the suggestion that Tristan Harris put forward in, an, in, an, in a piece in the Financial Times a few year, a year or two ago in which he suggested that social media be uh, considered like a public utility and um, brought to and held accountable for um, for the public good um, that 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 there be li- that perhaps there be licenses just sort of like like companies are held accountable for the environmental impact of their Um, their work, perhaps social media organizations should be held accountable um, and regulated in the same way. And um, maybe that the experience of being brought to hearings and having to answer questions about their impact on the public good would put that same kind of pressure that Erwin is talking about on them to to regulate and regulate themselves in additional ways. Head over to you, honey. Thank you. First of all, let me say, I don't like arguing with Erwin, who's arguably one of the finest legal minds in the country. So I, I'm not entirely fond of this vision, but I'm going to argue with him nevertheless. So a couple of things. One is, Erwin's absolutely right. The DMCA has been misused. And we should acknowledge that, that it is an imperfect piece of legislation. But to point to the misuse of the law and not point to where it has been effective in, for example, creating the Apple iStores and the Amazon Primes and the Netflix and the Hulus and where we now, unlike 15, 20 years ago, we're downloading movies and music all the time. And now we have a very robust online ecosystem where creators of movie and music and books are in fact paid. And has there been abuse? Sure. But to point to that abuse and say DMCA is on the whole negative, I think is incorrect. Now, to Erwin's question is, let's put social pressure on the social media. 
We've been doing that for 10 years. I mean, it's hard to think of a week that goes by without some scathing article around Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, Google, Amazon, Apple. And that has been going on for years now. Uh, last year, we tried an ad boycott against Facebook. It was one of the largest ad boycotts in history, it had hundreds and hundreds of company, and it fizzled out with absolutely no effect. We slapped a $6 billion fine onto Facebook, and they shrugged it off the next day with their stock price going up. When you have these massive trillion-dollar monopolistic companies, there is no social pressure. Understand, this isn't like the airline. It's not like an automotive industry or I can go down the street and buy a different brand because I don't like the practices of this company. We don't pay these companies. We're, we're not the customer. We're the product. And that's a very different relationship with the corporate uh, entity when it comes to putting pressure. And by the way, I will point out that as we're talking about the abuses of these companies, we are streaming this video on YouTube and Facebook. Why are we choosing to do that? We are, we're, we're just, we're seeding the middle ground to them. Why, for the love of God, are we, sorry, Facebook, why are we streaming this on Facebook? But to Erwin's point, that's the problem, is we all do this. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to a reporter who writes scathing articles about social media, the brilliant Wall Street Journal uh, Facebook files from last week. You know what it says at the bottom of the article? Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter, share on Facebook, share on Twitter. So, you know, it's, it's easy to say put social pressure, but that has not been working. And, and the last thing I'll say on this is I don't think any reasonable person says we should repeal Section 230. Um, but I think there are reasonable proposals for modifying it. And the one I like the most is from Eshu and M M Malinowski that says we are not, in fact, going to hold you for every single piece of content that gets uploaded to your service. But... If your algorithms reach into that sea of data and pluck out pieces of content and slap an ad on it and monetize it, you should have some responsibility for that. Because now you sound a lot like a publisher to me. And I think that's a reasonable, modest proposal. Having said that, we should, Erwin is right, we should tread lightly. But I don't think we can sit back anymore and just wait because what we have seen is horrific harm from online platforms, from child sexual abuse, to terrorism and extremism, illegal drugs, illegal weapons, sex trade, and disinformation that is destroying, as John was saying, existential threats to our democracy. And waiting around for Mark Zuckerberg to get it together, I just don't think is working. So John, do you have anything to add? If not, because I know you have to leave in a minute, else now we're gonna to go to Susan, who's gonna tell us how other countries have dealt with these problems and what the solutions are. Well, I, 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 I'm appreciating the conversation and, and just, just to sort of, and I think we can't wait. And at the same time, they're dangerous. But they're, you know, it's like it's like with the COVID, right? For the, the non-vaxxers, and I've talked to a number of them. It's like, you know, there's dangers in the vaccine. And yes, there may be some dangers in the vaccine, but there's also a danger in the virus. You know, and so that's a legitimate conversation, but just to point to one danger. Uh, and on this, I'm agnostic. I, so it's not like I'm, I don't know what to do, but I know we need to do something. And just saying that if the government in, involves in regulation, that's a greater danger. I'm not convinced that's accurate. That's maybe is empirical. But I do know, uh, as Henny suggested, just doing nothing, we're just sort of sliding into uh, the demise of our democracy. Uh, so I, I'd like to see some people seriously grapple with this. And then the last thing, as, as I said earlier, how do we actually deal with this, not just in the United States, the sort of fear of the other, the fear of people moving around is a global problem. Uh, and a lot of countries don't have the same kind of uh, loyalty to the First Amendment. And we are talking about monopolies, which, you know, years ago we said monopolies were bad, but now we sort of accept it essentially that these monopolies can do whatever they want to and we're, we're dependent on them. Uh, so the terrain has shifted. So I think we have to shift the way we think about it. I'm going to put you on mute and then stay on as long as I can, but I'm gonna, there's going to be some background noise. Thanks, John. Uh, so let's go to Susan uh, and... Uh... What do, uh, what's happening in other countries and what lessons can we learn from them? So um, one of the, the questions that I was thinking about in advance was just like what we can do to sort of rebuild from this moment that we're in. And I agree with, uh, I'm really intrigued by this conversation about regulating social media, thinking about what can be done proactively, um, because I do think this is a, a problem that makes it more difficult for, to, for us to do almost anything else. Um, I wanted to say that the most hopeful thing I've heard about the moment we're in 
uh, was was a tweet <laughs> from a uh, former UC Berkeley PhD and Meng, who's now at the University of Virginia. Um, and, and she said in a very offhand manner that I just found just like mind blowing was so for all of our worst case scenarios about where we're headed as a country, this could be the moment in which the US finally democratizes, not just on average, but for everyone, including those people whose participation has long been deliberately excluded. Um, and making participation in political life and, and real political representation available and accessible to all Americans is threatening to some people. Um, that is where some of our tumult is coming from. And I think it's important for us to think about that and to um, really counter that head on. So I am talking about this in reference to the US, not just talking about other countries around the world, um, but it's in part because all of a sudden my research on election violence and election fraud and democratic backsliding is suddenly relevant to, to the United States. And I'll say that in other countries that are divided, for example, those are, that, are, that are experiencing the immediate aftermath of a civil war in which neighbors were literally killing each other, um, not year, decades ago, but in uh, last year, there, there are really high levels of distrust as well. And it can be very hard to find domestic political actors that are viewed as neutral across the political spectrum that can cut through this hyper division that we're experiencing. Um, this is uh, particularly acute around elections, I think, um, because it has to do with whether people accept the outcome of those elections and they're willing to um, protest elections that are in fact stolen, um, but also accept the results of elections that were democratic and having a resource uh, available that can offer an opinion on whether the election was in fact problematic or not. Um, it is a problem that a lot of countries have, 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 have encountered. And this is where um, international election observation basically came from. Uh, countries that had super high levels of distrust domestically, that they couldn't find a resource domestically um, that was trusted across the political spectrum to make this critical judgment about whether or not elections were stolen, which can be very difficult for an average citizen to discern. Um, and so I think that when we, when we look towards solutions, I think there's a number of things that we should talk about that are very common in other countries I and mean, that might do move the needle a little bit in the United States. First of all, I'll, I keep saying this, I'm gonna say it in this forum too, election administration should be nonpartisan. It is the, the we are the only country in the world <laughs> that is vaguely democratic that has partisan election administration. And I think that we need to change that. I just don't think it's sustainable in the long term and it's a real problem today. Um, I can think of a number of other similar proposals that are worth a shot, including some electoral reforms, including a lot of other things. Um, but I think it's important to also say something about what's going on right now with the Republican Party. Um, Henry mentioned some of this at the beginning. Um, it has really been taken over by a set of anti-democratic forces, um, many of whom also support a white nationalist agenda. And they are actively using disinformation or taking advantage of the disinformation for their own political advantage. So I personally long for a Republican party that returns to its roots as a driver of policy, that puts forward serious policy ideas and that debates those ideas with other political parties. It's very hard to think about uh, a good outcome from the game that they are playing right now, which is a rejection of our country's political institutions, a questioning of the way that we've been doing things for so long and an outright and deliberate manipulation of their supporters through fear rather than persuasion and through proposing better policies. I think this is a very dangerous game. It's hard for me to see a way out of the place we are in as a country without confronting this problem, which I don't think it is a partisan issue. I think it is a democracy issue and is a democracy issue that is particularly uh, afflicting one of our two political parties. But in order to have a functioning democracy, we need to have two political parties that are playing by the rules of the democratic game and that are, that are not um, doing what many members of the, the Republican party leadership is doing right now. And I think that's a problem. I'll say one other idea that's concrete, it's small. And I'm just gonna say it really quickly because I think it's interesting. Um, I've been fretting about what to do just for my own self. What can I do to help support democracy in this country? Um, I think the, the conversation about social media is really interesting. But there's another thing that a lot of other countries have experience with, again, that came out of this periods of distrust, um, hyper-partisanship, um, and, and that is a grand coalition of organizations, leaders, 
civic groups that participate as nonpartisan domestic election observers. It's a very small thing, but I think it's very possible that people need additional experience that I'm, I'm curious if it would make people more likely to put democracy above their own more narrow political interests in this country. It has worked in a lot of other countries. It also can potentially provide, I don't, maybe um, an opportunity for the pro-democracy Republican actors, as well as civic business, religious and other groups to, to unify around defending US democracy. Um, we, we can imagine campuses getting involved with this kind of thing too, that's very common in other countries. So it's a, it's a little bit of a lark, it's an idea I'm throwing out there. I know some people are working on it, but I think um, things like this, initiatives like this that are, that are participatory for lots of people and that involve pro-democracy political participation, I think, uh, could could move the needle a little bit in the right direction. So I wanted to end on a hopeful note. Great, thanks, Susan. Now, I want to go back to Erwin, uh, but I want to first propose uh, a bunch of things. Uh, these social media companies are enormously rich. They have tremendous amounts of money. They're monopolies. Uh, can't we require more of them? Uh, maybe not that they monitor every single transaction that occurs through their pipes, uh, but maybe we can say things like they have to support public ser service forums at a very large level and really support local journalism, for example. Uh, perhaps they could support efforts to have uh, deliberative polls in local areas that which bring together a random sample of local people uh, and who get together and then discuss politics and that's put on the medium and so on and so forth. Can't we find some way to make sure that they're thinking about their social responsibilities in a bigger way? Another way might be to rate them in terms of social responsibility uh, and to make that a public uh, thing that everybody knows about and to, in fact, say there's pressure on them to make sure that they are socially responsible. Can't we do some of those kinds of things? Yes, unquestionably so. I don't deny the threat that exists to democracy right now. I think to some extent though, blaming social media and internet is blaming the messenger. I think the problems in our society that are leading to the threat to democracy are much greater than and not caused by the internet and social media, though internet and social media contribute to it. And as you were just saying, and I'll talk about, can be part of the solution. In contrary to you said, I'm not an absolutist when it comes to the First Amendment. I believe that there is speech that's unprotected by the First Amendment. Child pornography, incitement, true threats, and other things. But I also believe that there is a benefit in our society of having platforms for speech that anyone can participate in and anyone can use to reach a mass audience. Up until the development of the internet, one of the main problems with regard to speech was the scarcity of media and how little most people had access to be able to get their message across. We're now in the golden age of free speech and I wanna be sure we don't lose that. Now, in terms of creating liability, something that was raised earlier, if you create liability on social media companies for anything that's posted there, they will have to monitor and they will greatly over-censor. There is the proposal that some have offered of, well, if they have noticed that it's harmful speech, force them to take down. It was in that context that I referred to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and we can talk about that in detail, but I think the takedown provisions of it have been much more harmful than good. In fact, there have been other efforts to re regulate speech on the internet and social media. And I think on balance, they've been counterproductive. There was a law adopted a few years ago called the Allow States and Victims to Fight Online Sex Trafficking, FOSTA, that was meant to try to keep things like that page from advertising for sex there. And what we found is it hasn't decreased trafficking and in terms of protecting sex workers, it's been very harmful. It hasn't achieved what it's want, it's had greater harms. So my point isn't an absolutist one against regulation. My point is that I think we've gotta be very careful that what we do doesn't end up being much worse than what we have now. Um, now, with regard to what you said a moment ago, Henry, I think there are things that can be done. You mentioned three, tax the social media companies to help local media. I think that would be constitutional. I think it would be appropriate. Martha Minow, the former Dean of Harvard Law School in a new book has proposed something like that. I think that would be constitutional. I think our having some entity that rates social media platforms, 
I think that would be constitutional. That's just more speech. Forcing the social media companies to hold events and then to publicize them, I think that unquestionably would violate the First Amendment. Because remember, it's the government regulating these media platforms and government regulation raises First Amendment questions. Maybe if nothing else, what this discussion shows is it's enormously complicated. But in the end, I am so distrustful of government regulation, I'm willing to accept the benefits of unregulated speech. Thanks, Erwin. Uh, and I think it, these, this is the nexus of the problem, is that on the one hand, we want to make sure that we continue to have free speech. But on the other hand, speech has gotten a bit out of hand. And the question is, what do we do in those circumstances? Honey, you've been shaking your head in various ways. Uh, tell us what you think about these issues. Good. Uh, a couple of thoughts. Again, I don't like to argue with <laughs> Erwin, but a couple of things about SESTA-FOSTA, first of all, which was designed to protect children online. Let's first acknowledge that companies like Backpage were hiding behind Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act and knowingly trafficking in young children, and they got protection. That is insane. <laughs> and so SESTA-FOSTA was in response to this absolute um, horrific misuse of that law. Now, if you look at the impact of SESTA-FOSTA, Erwin's right. It didn't actually reduce, reduce sex trafficking. But the reason is not because of the law. The reason is because of the global nature of the internet, because this law only impacted US-based companies. And so what happened is everybody just migrated to other platforms. So it wasn't so much that the law wasn't effective. It's just that we have a very leaky border in the digital world. And by the way, the claims that sesta fosta was going to lead to more violence against women is not sustained. There's a recent study, large-scale study from the Carnegie Mellon University that showed that, in fact, that has stayed steady. And in fact, what happened is right after the law was passed, there was a decrease in sex trafficking as the platforms, the U.S.-based platforms, were no longer able to, to have the ads. But then it had a rebound over time when everything migrated offshore. So was the law effective? Was it not effective? Well, it depends on how you actually count. Now, to Erwin's point too about, I would rather have everybody participating because once you start taking down speech, we run into this problem. But here's the issue, is we have a problem on say Twitter where women on a daily basis are subjected to horrible abuse people of color, people from the LGBTQ community, community um, immigrants. And so what, what happens to their voice? What happens to their voice when the most vitriolic, hateful, spiteful, angry, and not necessarily illegal content shuts out other voices? So saying everybody should have a voice, I think is a little naive on the way the internet works. Because if you are a person who is from an underrepresented group, you are gonna get off Twitter and you're gonna get off Facebook and you're gonna get off YouTube because on a daily basis, there are horrors that you are being subjected to, which frankly, you just decide, look, I don't want it. And then the bullies win. So I think this is where Erwin and I disagree. I don't actually trust the government either, but I certainly don't trust private companies who have one mandate and one band-aid only, which is to maximize shareholder returns. And what we have seen in every industry, online or offline, is that left to their own devices, these companies will do exactly what they are mandated to do, which is to maximize shareholder profit. And when you have a monopoly in this space, rate the social media companies all you want. What are you gonna do, go to MySpace? I mean, where are you gonna go? Rates Facebook as a zero on a scale of zero to 100, where are people going to go? We're still going to be streaming this video on Facebook. So I just, you know, maybe Erwin's right that the government can overreach, but not having the government step in and put some pressure points doesn't seem to be working either. And I saw Susan's hand up. Yeah, Susan, uh, maybe you can tell us about, uh, Hani has made it clear that there's global dimensions to this, and maybe you can discuss some of that. Yeah, I just I, w I wanted to just say something else, which is just that because I'm thinking about um, the change in the rules of the game, right, not just playing the game that we have in the United States and we've had for a long time, um, upholding our Constitution, um, continuing to live in the system we currently live in. The, the concern that I have is that the problem that we're facing is one that's going to send us into uh, a system of government, um, not to be too alarmist, but that is authoritarian and doesn't allow for any kind of free speech. Um, and so at the extreme, what we're talking about is, is you know, continuing to sort of 
dance the tango on a on a sinking ship and it's 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 just not working um to have democracy this is a fundamental threat to democracy what we're seeing right now and the constitution is not going to matter <laughs> on some level if we get to this really extreme um worst case scenario i'm not there yet but i do think about the worst case scenario right and 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 i and i think that we do have to confront that the constitution is not going to matter under those circumstances so I, I want to go around. Uh, Gita, I just want to ask you about journalism, and then we'll get back to Hanny and, and maybe Irwin. Um, but just to ask you about what do you think that journalism could positively do to solve some of these problems? Is there a way to give voice uh, to some of the people who Hani worries will be thrown off Facebook and Twitter uh, through better journalism and uh, methods like that? I mean, apps, journalism itself needs to do a better job of giving voice to underrepresented groups. I mean, we journalism, um, leadership in journalism is disproportionately made up of privileged social classes. That has to change. Um, as a journalism school, we're committed to trying to change, to take the lid off who gets to become a journalist in this country, because we know who the storytellers are matters, because we all see the world through the prism of our own lived experiences. But all of that said, um, if we change who the storytellers are, if we produce the highest impact investigative stories, if we are telling stories from the points of view of indigenous people and underrepresented people, if no one is reading those stories because they are buried on social media platforms where everyone is going to get their news in an increasingly polarized world, then journalism itself becomes irrelevant. Um, we can be producing the best work, but if no one has access to it because the infrastructure that we've created, the monopolistic infrastructure has algorithms that bury journalism, then, um, then our work is meaningless. And this, as Susan has, and many others have said, this is a huge threat to democracy because we are, um, we are um, just creating we're taking away the ability, we're creating an unlevel playing field where disinformation um, and, and angry, fearful, fear-mongering proliferate and the best stories, however excellent and equitable they are, are just hidden. Honey, is there any way to try to figure out uh, how to rate sources so that people could know what the reliable sources are. I know there are truth uh, checking, fact checking uh, yeah. entities out there. I don't know that they get much play for most people, but is there some way we could uh, direct people to better places? Sure, absolutely, there are. And there are many very good, serious journalists and fact checking organizations that will fact check uh, posts, will fact check uh, sites. But here's the problem, and it gets back to something that Susan said that I think is incredibly important, is that what we have seen unfolding over the last few years is not just people believe the earth is flat, not just believe that Hillary Clinton is running a child porn ring out of a pizza joint in DC. It's that they also now, as Gita was saying, they don't trust the media. But you know who else they don't trust? They don't trust the government. They don't trust institutions. They don't trust experts. They don't trust you, Henry, and they don't trust me because we're a bunch of liberal loving uh, academics. And when you get into that world where we don't trust in institutions, we don't trust governments, we don't trust experts, we don't trust scientists, fact check all you want, it's not going to matter because people know what they know and they listen to who they need to listen to. And back to Susan's point is, we, you know, if we get into this world, which we've already are dangerously into, where we don't trust our government, we don't trust the media, we don't trust the experts, how do we address social change? How do we address climate change? How do we have democracy? How do we deal with a global pandemic? And so that's the, the fear I have is that we've completely eroded trust. And so is it too late? Can we return from this? Are we ever going to get to a place where people are going to trust the fact checkers? I don't know. I'm fearful that we may be getting close to that tipping point of no return. Well, in my research, what I've shown is that over the last 50 years, there's been an extraordinary diminution in trust for institutions and a polarization in trust, as I mentioned at the outset. 
And it's something that has me deeply worried. It used to be that most people from both parties trusted major American institutions, and they didn't have particularly different opinions about those institutions. Now it's highly polarized, and that makes it very hard for those institutions uh, to operate, uh, for example, in the midst of the COVID epidemic, when people don't trust science, they don't trust medicine, uh, they don't trust all sorts of institutions. So, Susan, are there anything, are there things that other countries are doing that we could think of uh, that might help solve some of these problems? Uh, or is there really very little experimentation that looks useful? Well, I tried, I tried to talk about a couple of those things in my last round of remarks, but I do think that um, I'm going to reemphasize one of the problems and I'll ask the question, which is that I see um, some of that distrust. Henry, this is really a question for you, but you know, happy if others want to answer it. Um, I have read with hope that partisans follow party leaders, right? And so part of the problem that we're in right now is not because citizens are pulling the Republican Party really far into this uh arena of distrust, right? And of distrust of media, of distrust of government, of all of these things. We can go back to Reagan. We can talk about where this came from. You know, um, I'm, I'm here from the government and I'm, I'm here to help um, as, a, as a terrifying phrase. I think that um, I, I would like to talk about whether there's anything that can be done to increase the pro-democracy nature of, of the Republican party. That could be through business interests. I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest from other countries that businesses prefer to live in democracies, right? They prefer to do business in democracies. They prefer to have their headquarters in democracies. It is, authoritarian regimes tend to be a lot more corrupt, right? And you just have to pay more bribes. You have to, you have to deal with less stringent regulations. So I could go on about this forever, but I wanted to sort of pose a question. Um, is this a locus where we should be focusing attention for reform? And is there any reason to be hopeful about that? Um, because I, in, from my view, comparatively, you just can't fix this problem when you have a major political party in a two party system leading their supporters in this super extreme direction. And they themselves seem to be afraid of their most extreme supporters, right? I'm not sure that they're all true, true believers. There may not be that many people who are, who are real true followers of QAnon, but man, it does seem like congressional leaders are afraid of them right now. Yeah, I think it was interesting that during the last election, we found some companies who actually came down on the side of democracy. And uh, of course, uh, people on the right were highly critical of that. I think shocked, in fact, to find out that people who traditionally had been supporters of the Republican Party were suddenly being critical of the Republican Party and what had happened during the November election. Um, and by the way, that brings me to Fox News, which a question from the audience uh, is here, and they, they want to know what can we do about Fox News, and I'd be interested in anybody who has any ideas about that, or are they just a fact of life and you have to live with them uh, because of the marketplace of ideas? Uh, Irwin? Yeah. 30% of Americans who said at the beginning believed that Donald Trump won the election. 15% of Americans believe that QAnon and what they say is true. What do we do about that? And that's the same question you asked me. What do we do about Fox News? Do we want someone to have the power in our society to say that those things are false and to exclude speech that we believe is false? Who would we want to give that power to? I'd be very afraid to say, Somebody has the power to say, this is what's true and false with regard to the election or QAnon or on Fox News. Because if you give that power to us today, tomorrow we're not going to be an authority and they're going to decide that what we believe is false and censor us. So if you don't like Fox News, don't watch Fox News. But I don't think the solution can be censorship or liability for the speech that we don't like. We're going to get to Hani in a minute. Let me just say, uh, one of the things that stuns me is that Tucker Carlson, however, is used in court cases of defense that nobody believes pretty much what he says. And therefore, how can you possibly criticize him for saying things that are untrue? Because actually, he's just a storyteller. So That's is there silly. a problem there with our libel laws, Erwin? Yeah, but that, of course, I mean, and this has come up in the context of Sidney Powell and the false things she said about the election machines. Right. And there is liability for defamation, false things that injure reputation. And there should be liability for that. And I think it's a silly defense for Sidney Powell to say, oh, no one believed me anyway. That's never been a defense to defamation. So I'm not an absolutist. I do think we can have liability for defamation and other things, but I'm very afraid of giving anyone the power to decide in our society what's politically true and what's false and censor what we don't like. 
honey. And then soon- I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to make the point that I don't think that's the that's what I'm saying, Erwin. I'm not saying that the government should decide what is true and false. And I don't think any reasonable person would say that. What I'm saying is that social medias don't take two ideas and put them on an equal platform. They don't take Trump won the election, Trump didn't win the election, and give them fair ground. They are biased. They give the most outrageous, conspiratorial, and sensational content more airtime than less airtime. And I'm simply saying, I don't want to hold the companies or the government responsible for what's true or not, but I want a fair marketplace. And I don't think it's too much to ask for a fair marketplace. By all means, let all the ideas be out there, but let's let it be fair. Let's not favor the most outrageous, salacious, and because they're doing exactly what you are afraid of, but in the opposite direction. And I'm just trying to level the playing field as opposed to saying what is true and what is not true, which I don't think we want to get in the business of doing. But how do we get there, uh, honey? I think the question is, is that I think we would wish many of us that their algorithms didn't try to focus on the most outrageous communications because that gets the adrenaline and the uh, 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 pumping and gets us all very excited and we want to know more, more, more. Uh, But how do we do that? I mean, it's not clear to me that there's an obvious way to do it uh, short of trying to really get inside the algorithms and tell the media companies how to do those things. Sure. I don't think there is an obvious way to do it, and I think it has to be a multidimensional. So first of all, we need some competition in Silicon Valley. There's basically five tech companies right now, and they're multi-trillion dollar companies, and there's no oxygen in Silicon Valley for better ideas, for better business model, for a better moral compass. And so we need to really think about how to give some oxygen. And by the way, when, when Google steps up and says, no, 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 we should not be regulating the technology sector or doing anything with antitrust, we should remind the po- folks at Google is that the reason they exist is because the Department of Justice stepped in and told Microsoft to knock it off and give room to this little upstart. And so there is room for the government to step in and say, we need more oxygen. I I disagree with Erwin here. I think we need modest, sensible regulation to hold the company somewhat responsible for how their algorithms are selecting content, not for what it's being selected, but for how it's selecting. We obviously need more education. We obviously need technology to do better on the algorithmic side without introducing a whole nother set of biases. For example, we don't want algorithms that are biased against Uh, content generated by women or content generated by people of color. So we have to be thoughtful about that. And I don't think any one of these things is going to get us, but I think we have to pull on all of these strings equally and find a, a, a more civilized online platform. And look, don't get me wrong. I'm a technologist. I'm a computer scientist by training. I believe in the power of technology. I really do. But this is not the internet I was promised 20 years ago. I just wanted to say that um, I, I, I made this point less well before, but I wanted to say very bluntly that I think it'll be a real shame if democracy dies on the altar of free speech. You don't get to have free speech in authoritarian regimes. It's just not how it works. We don't see that anywhere. Um, and so I think that I, I just want to emphasize that we have to get out of this. I remember it's been a long time since I took and or GSI for constitutional law, but I'm pretty sure that you can't falsely yell fire in a crowded theater. Um, and, and I believe that still holds. And there just has to be a way for us to do something about this. The other thing I just wanted to add for those who are interested in this, there's a wonderful book by Robert Dahl. It's older called After the Revolution. And he talks about the power of expertise versus the power of democracy. Um, And it is wonderful and you should read it. I think it has some really interesting insights about when expertise is necessary for a democratic system to continue to function. Um, And I think that's some of what we're talking about here. Um, Gita, I feel like that's journalists in many cases. I wanna thank an extraordinary panel and a wonderful discussion. Uh, Gita Anon, the Graduate School of Journalism Dean Erwin Chemerinsky, the Dean of the Law School. And Erwin, thank you especially uh, for being willing to push a particular point of view and give us something to discuss, which was great. Uh, Hani Farid, who's the head of the School of Information, Susan Hyde, who's the chair of the Department of Political Science, and John Powell, who's director of the Othering and Belonging Institute. This has been a fabulous panel. I thank you all. Thank you.